everyone. I'm Jensine Bard, and welcome to Testimony, where truth is told, lives are changed, and hope is given. Revelation 12:11 tells us that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, a testimony of your story for His glory. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome to Testimony at a National Religious Broadcasters Convention Special 2021 at the fabulous Gaylord in Grapevine, and yes, that's Texas, candidate for the governor of California. A high honor indeed, and I will say in advance, the Honorable John Cox. John Cox, sir, welcome to Testimony. It's my honor to be with you, Jensine. Well, it's an honor to have you here, sir. We first met at an American Renewal Project forum where you shared your riveting, heartbreaking, yet hopeful story Mm -hmm. of overcoming to become all God intended and have achieved to date, making you a favorite, my view, to take back California from the hands of unrighteous Rule, But before we get to all of that in our brief time here today, would you just share with our listeners how you came to faith in Jesus Christ and the impact of that decision and your segue to where you are today in your run to unseat a disastrous Newsom? John Cox, please tell us that story. Well, uh, it's an interesting story, I guess, uh, because uh, of the circumstances of my birth. Um, My mom was a very educated woman. She went to Berkeley, California to get her degrees. She got two master's degrees ultimately from Berkeley. Uh, This is a woman who in the 40s went down to Chile to teach poverty-stricken children how to read and write English. so as a single woman traveling to Chile in the, in the 40s, um, my, uh, she met the love of her life in uh, California and in San Francisco and married him. His name was McGinty, and uh, they uh, had a baby, my bro- older brother Michael. Um, he unfortunately turned into a raging alcoholic, and they got divorced. And she then had to move back to Chicago where she was from. Her parents were still there. They had a tiny little hardware store on the south side of Chicago. And she met my father, who, as my mother later told me, uh, attacked her and and kind of a date rape, I guess we would call it today. Uh, He ended up marrying her to to give me a name, in essence, uh, but then left. Uh, They didn't get along, clearly, and uh, I never saw him again. Never heard from him, never helped in any respect. so I always, you know, kind of questioned, you know, who I was or where I was from because I didn't know my whole side of my father's family. I really didn't know them at all. Uh, he had a couple of children from a prior marriage. I, I think I remember meeting them when I was 14 or something for a short visit, but nothing, you know, of any length. Wow. But I had no religion either. My mom wasn't religious at all. And uh, I remember one time Jehovah's Witnesses came knocking at the door and gave me a copy of the Watchtower, you know, their, their publication, and I read that and just started having questions about, you know, where I was and, and more importantly, where I was going. Um, you know, I, I had friends that went to church and, you know, they didn't really talk about it much. You know, young boys don't necessarily do that when you're playing baseball together and things. And um, But then uh, I started getting more curious as I got older. Um, I went to college. I had a work my way through college. There was no money in the family. My mom was a school teacher. She had married my stepfather who was a postal worker, but he didn't make much money either. And he worked nights, so I never really saw him very much. Uh, he, he was kind of a brutal guy too. Um, wow. I didn't get along with him at all. And um, ultimately I uh, determined to get out of that house. Uh, I had grown up uh, kind of as the mom myself. I did all the cooking and cleaning and washing. My mom was the major breadwinner, and uh, she also loved to play bridge, so she was out most nights playing bridge. Um, But uh, my faith life really began when I met my first wife, Nancy. Uh, 
you know, she was Catholic, so, and her parents regularly attended church. You know, she had gone to Catholic school. I don't think she was a great Catholic, but uh, she, uh, she had gone to Catholic school, but wasn't really, you know, as involved in the church. So I, I started going to church with my wife, and I really absorbed the message. It was Catholic, but it was, I really absorbed the message. I really appreciated the message, and I started taking instructions secretly. Uh, I was going to surprise her to uh, to be uh, baptized uh, and confirmed as a Catholic. So I, I met a wonderful priest uh, at, at a church near where I lived, um, near Wheaton, Illinois. And uh, Jim Lennon was his name, great, great man. We would take long walks and we'd talk about life and we'd talk about God and we'd talk about our future and, and other things. And uh, I ultimately you know, did, went through the whole instruction and was baptized and, and confirmed as a Catholic, but there was still, you know, not a complete embrace of God yet. And uh, so I, I was a CPA by the time I was 20 years old. Um, wow. Yeah, I finished college in two and a half years um, because I was paying for it. <laughs> uh, I always joked that my I had a daughter that took five years because I was paying for it. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I, I was in a hurry to get through. Uh, I took advanced placement exams. I was a, a very, very good student. I'm, my mom's intellect, I guess, was passed on to me. And um, so uh, I was working as a CPA, uh, and I went to law school at night. And that was a very tough schedule. I would always get on the train. I had an hour train ride in Chicago, and I'd get on the train, and I'd immediately crack open my book, and I would be sitting there doing my casework and doing all the preparation, all the homework that I had to do that day, because I was working 60 hours a week as a CPA at a, at a major accounting firm, Coopers and Library. One day, this gentleman sat down next to me on my, on my way home from, uh, you know, uh, downtown. It was like nine o'clock at night, and I was dog tired, and he started talking to me, and I kind of didn't want to talk because I had to get my work done, and I was kind of tired, and his name was Lou Blonde. And uh, he started giving me his testimony at, at various points. And we talked and set, you know, we had about an hour and a half train ride uh, out to Wheaton, and, uh, which is yeah. where he lived too. You know, Wheaton College, the Billy Graham went there. And uh, it basically, I was born again that day. I mean, uh, he gave me a Bible. It was October 31st, 1979. I still have it. I don't have it with me here. It's in my briefcase. But, um, you know, that, that really what brought me to the Lord. And I started attending Bible study, a Christian Businessmen's Committee, which is out of Chattanooga. I now have a nephew who's at Covenant College in <laughs> Chattanooga uh, studying to be a pastor. Awesome. Baptist, a Baptist pastor. It's wonderful. And uh, my brother, my older brother, is now with the Lord. Uh, but he, he produced three wonderful boys. And um, so I, I was born again that day uh, and through the efforts of Lou and, and uh, I started to attend regularly Bible study. I probably did that for about four or five years. And uh, wow. really uh, another great man, Bob Schill, was just like a father to me and, and really, really led me along. And I really, you know, felt such a, a connection with the Lord and uh, you know ultimately uh, I you know we, my wife and I got married obviously when we had three wonderful girls and I became very involved in the church I was on the parish school board I was a lector for 20 years at the church I even taught religious education sixth graders wow um, how was that fun Incredible fun um, because I love. I always said that sixth graders were old enough to understand things, and so we could have a nice discussion. But they were still young enough that they feared me, so they didn't have uh, a lot of behavior issues or anything like that. They they still knew I could talk to their parents, and you know, and they would have some you know discipline. Exactly, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to candidate for governor John Cox. John, please continue. Well, thanks. Uh, you know, I had a wonderful life with my wife. I, I thought we had a wonderful marriage. And one day I got home from playing golf. And I came home and I found her on the floor of the bathroom crying. And uh, 
you know, I was like a shot out of the blue. She told me she didn't love me anymore. She, you know, we had gotten married. I was 21 or so. She was 21. And, you know, we were just very young. I was eager to get married to get out of the household situation. And, right. You know, and uh, she was with me all through law school and, and really helped me when my business was getting going and other things like that. But, you know, I had a couple of setbacks in business. You know, I had a partnership that dissolved and a couple other things that were tough for her to handle. And, uh, and she had some problems in her own background with her older brother and some other things, or younger brother, I should say, that, that, that were an issue. And uh, she discovered that she just had never been fully satisfied and, and happy in our marriage. And hmm. we went uh, counseling for two full years, uh, several psychiatrists and regular visits, and we, we tried to work it out, and uh, it, it didn't. We ultimately decided to, to split, um, you know, uh, that was sad. I, I ended up getting it an old for the Catholic Church because I, I wanted to remarry again. And I wanted to remarry under the auspices of the church. I felt very strongly about that. Even though you were a born-again Christian yeah. at the time? Oh, totally. You know, mm -hmm. and I knew that, you know, it was sad to have a divorce. And I had hoped that, you know, God would forgive me, but... You know, we'll find that out at some point in time here. I think he did. Um, but uh, I now am married to the wonderful Sarah, my princess. And uh, my God, we have so much in common. Uh, it's just the opposite of my first marriage. Uh, we love each other. We're dedicated to each other. We have so many interests together. And she's in love with me, and I'm in love with her. And it's just a wonderful partnership, and I couldn't be happier. We have a daughter together, so it's my fourth daughter. So I had three daughters with my first wife, and now I have another daughter with, with, with uh, Sarah. Julianne is just wonderful. The last semester, she got five A-pluses and two A's. Uh, it's just, you know, That's phenomenal. Joy. I'm just so proud of her. Well, you know, I'm reminded, ladies and gentlemen, again, you're listening to candidate for governor John Cox at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Grapevine, Texas. John, it is such a pleasure to have you here today in our brief moments here today sharing your powerful testimony. You know, I'm reminded of a scripture. I can't quote it exactly, but it says that the unbelieving one or the partner wants to leave, let them. Yeah. And then God really determines the rest. I've heard this story so many times where one partner isn't happy and then God blesses uh, the remaining spouse uh, with the, quote, love of his or her life, uh, what God intended. So uh, that said, you persevered. You have four beautiful daughters yeah. now. What yeah. a wonderful um, accomplishment. I now want to get to your run for governor, yeah. the issues at stake, California at stake, Governor Newsom, how he has literally destroyed our economy in California and basically shut everyone down when he is having dinner at the French Laundry. Can you just speak to that? Thank you. Uh, you know, I've always opposed corruption. I, uh, my mom was very political. I got involved in politics very early because of, of, of political corruption I saw in Chicago. And I finally moved to California. My mother, by the way, had retired from the Chicago Public School Districts to Fresno, California. So she lived the last 20 years of her life in, in California. Um, her two sisters, my aunts, were also you know, Californians their whole life. So I, I, it was natural I would end up in California in that respect. Um, and I got to California, I discovered it was so mismanaged and so corrupt, uh, as better or worse than Chicago and Illinois. And uh, I've determined to do something about it. Uh, God's blessed me with tremendous material goodness. I mean, my businesses have just done very, very well. And I, I feel that, you know, God has called me to be of service. Uh, and I, 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 I see the, the same kinds of problems. And Mr. Newsom is not only hypocritical based on that French laundry dinner, but it's also corruption. Because the people that were with him at that dinner were lobbyists and, and interest group representatives. And that's, you know, that's the dinner he broke his own rules to go to, go to, um, to serve those masters and not, not the people. And you can see that through everything that goes on in California. I mean, we have the worst housing 
costs in the country. Um, the housing business is the one I'm in. I build and manage apartments. Uh, real estate is a natural for a lawyer and a CPA. <laughs> Uh, Absolutely, I can use my 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 talents for you know financial and legal work there, and um, the cost of housing is just unbelievably expensive in California. It's price the middle class into the lower class. Uh, you know, there's there's there it's poverty. Uh, the cost of living is so high. Uh, homelessness, as a result, is one of the worst things in California. The people living on the streets in tent cities. It's filthy. It's uh, it's it's uh, unsanitary and it's demoralizing to people to see all that on the, on, on the streets and the sidewalks and the public parks. Um, at the same time, our taxes are the highest in the country and our poverty rate is also the highest. Uh, our schools are some of the worst performing in the country even though we spend billions on them. Um, Parents found out during this pandemic that they had no power to get their teachers back in the classrooms. Uh, pastors, by the way, also found out during the pandemic that where they rate because the the governor closed the churches. Strip clubs stayed open, right? But churches were closed. Uh, exactly. And small businesses were crushed. Uh, our business climate in California is the worst in the forty nine states. The lawsuits you have to endure, the bureaucracy, the forms you have to fill out, the layers of approvals and things are just incredible barriers to opportunity for people. On top of this, we now have a electricity shortage and a water shortage, believe it or not. I mean, in California in the 21st century, we don't have enough electricity to power air conditioners when it's hot. So when you get back to the desert, you see, <laughs> try to turn your air conditioner on, you, you may be told you can't operate it because there's not enough electricity. Meanwhile, Mr. Newsom has said that we're all going to drive electric cars in about 15 years. Now, where are we going to get all that electricity? Doesn't explain that. Exactly. Uh, the water situation, we haven't done desalination to any great degree. We haven't done recycling. We haven't built reservoirs. We've actually taken down reservoirs. So there's there's a water shortage that's man-made and government caused. Um, crime and fires threaten us. Uh, crime rate has just skyrocketed. Walgreens a few weeks ago shut all their stores in San Francisco because of shoplifting. They can't operate. And if Walgreens can't do that, think about all the other shops and stores that can't operate. Well. Wow. Uh, murder rate has gone up, uh, break-ins, uh, there's now people shooting kids on the freeway. Uh, meanwhile, fires. You know, the, in the last 20, 30 years, the politicians have chased the lumber industry out of California. We used to have a lot of lumber. And the lumber industries took care of the forest for us. I mean, they made sure that they didn't burn because that was their inventory. But now they're out of business. Most of the lumber industry is Canada. We import it, and prices have gone skyrocket this year. But we need to bring back the lumber industry, and we need to manage those forests. We're also building a train in the Central Valley. You've heard about this, this high-speed rail. That's been an unbelievable boondoggle. It's now spent, I think, $10 billion, and, and, it's, and it's not even near completed. It's way behind schedule. We should have been spending that money on airplanes that would be outfitted with tanks of water or fire retardant to get in and get these fires out before they turn into infernos. Instead, we're wasting the money on a train that's never going to be built or never going to be ridden on. So it's all of these areas of mismanagement that uh, that I think you know provide a, a good basis for people to, to agree to the recall and to want to see a business guy elected. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, again, you're listening to candidate for governor, John Cox. How do we solve these problems in a culture cancel, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. and with an administration that is anything but democratic, but socialist, Marxist, communist? Well, we have to stand up. You know, it's, it's the same battle Ronald Reagan fought 
you know, it's 40 years ago that Ronald Reagan became president of the United States. And similarly, you know, America wasn't being run very well with Jimmy Carter. We had gas lines, we had electricity shutoffs, we had a we had cardigans, remember? No Christmas lights. <laughs> Uh, f foreign policy was a disaster. Reagan came in and, and said, we can do better than this, and, and we need to emphasize freedom, and we need to get away from socialism, which is really just big government controlling everything. Well, California is a typical example of the failure of big government. The best tool to provide a, a quality life is freedom and free markets and free will. And this is where my faith comes in, because I believe God gave all of us a free will to love him because he wanted that love to be free. He, that's the best kind of love. I want my children to love me, but I don't want to force them to love me. In communism, communists don't want religion because it's competition. They want people to love the state. The state is the God in communism. And that's the case in California today. Gavin Newsom and his band want everybody to give their loyalty to the government and look to the government to do everything. I'm more of a Reagan who will say, we need to be free. We need to solve these problems with the free market. And, and that applies culturally as well as economically. And I think that's a message Californians are longing to hear that we can address these problems, we can deliver a quality of life, but it's going to be based upon freedom and free will and opportunity for everybody. And that's the Reagan message. And, and frankly, I think that's, you know, that was the Reagan message in 1981. This is the John Cox Reagan message of 2021. And it's the same today. Amen and amen. You know, um, soon to be Governor Cox, I'm believing that in faith. Uh, the scripture tells us that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice, and mm -hmm. when the unrighteous rule, the people groan. We see so much of that yeah. uh, today uh, with all the shutdowns, COVID, which I believe has been politicized oh. egregiously totally. so. Your yeah. thoughts on that? Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the politicians, again, have used this pandemic to accelerate their power. And think about it. I mean, it's just been tremendous for the government business because everybody looks to every government decree now to, you know, can I open my business? Can I have a, my kid in school? Can I open my church? Give me the rules. Give me the rules. Give me the rules. And, you know, when somebody sets the rules for everybody else, they have power. And that's what it's all about. Well, you know, I look to God to have power over me ultimately, you know, because of the dictates of my eternal life. But I want to be free for my life while I'm here on earth. And, and, and that's what I'm looking for. And we can solve these problems in California, but we're not going to do it with a government that mismanages things. What government should be doing is clearing the playing field so that everybody has opportunity, so everybody has freedom to innovate. Now, we need the rule of law. We can't have complete chaos and freedom to do whatever we want. God gives us the rule of law and the Ten Commandments. Exactly. As well as the Bible, right? Every, you know, we, we look for that for truth. So we can certainly look to government to have the rule of law and provide guide rails for us to do things. But there's a point at which government needs to step back, enforce that rule of law, but let people be free. Let the free market reign. Let there be competition. And I think if we accelerate competition in technology, in education, I'm a big believer in school choice, giving parents the power of choice and competition. I think we should have that economically. Uh, we should have a hundred banks competing for our business. We should have a, a dozen cable TV companies competing for our business. We should have a dozen Facebooks and Twitters to choose from so they can't abuse their, their privileges. I mean, to me, competition is the ultimate regulator. It's the ultimate way to make sure that we have the right things available to ourselves. So question in a remaining time here today, 
John Cox candidate for the governor of California. What on day one is the first thing you will do in this regard? I will call a special session of the legislature and present a package of housing reforms because I believe housing is the crisis economic issue of California. There are obviously a whole lot of issues, cultural as well as big government and regulations, but housing is the starting point because it's what's driven up the cost of living, which is driving a lot of people out of the state. Um, there's so many people in California that spend 30, 40, 50, 80 percent of their income on housing. That drives up salaries. That also then drives up the cost of food, health care, clothing, everything you buy is driven up by labor and salaries, including taxes. The government is mostly labor. So the government has to pay higher salaries because of the housing costs. So if I want to reduce this wage price spiral, I have to attack housing first and foremost. Then it's on to homelessness and treating addictions and treating mental illness and making sure that we get public-private partnerships to do that. It's also addressing water and, and energy shortages, you know, and, and of course, culturally, you know, making sure the churches stay open, making sure that our, that the government doesn't, you know, put restrictions on our ability to practice our faith. So, you know, those are the major topics. Uh, education is right up there as well, talking about getting our kids not only back in school, but giving parents more power over their children's education, more alternatives to education. I'll be pushing for that from day one. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to candidate for governor, John Cox. You can learn more about John's work, ministry, and mission by visiting johncox.com. That's johncox.com. You will be blessed inspired and given hope that you did. John Coxer, I just want to thank you for being with us today on testimony, not only sharing your personal testimony, but your years of experience as a leader, the leader we need for California today. We thank you. We honor you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Testimony is a global broadcast made possible by the generous contributions of our valued partners at Jensen Bard Ministries and you, our listening audience. Together, we are reaching souls for Christ, one testimony at a time. If you would like information on how you can support this broadcast with your tax-deductible gift, please visit us at jensenbard.com. That's one word, J-E-N-S-I-N-E-B-A-R-D dot com. And join the conversation at our Facebook page, Testimony with Jensine Bard. Thank you for listening, and please join us again for Testimony. Testimony.